All right. Hello, hello. We're back to Possum Lodge. <laughs> Episode 17. That's a nice number. I think I remember being 17. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Uh, that's 50 years ago? 50, 60, uh, 50 years ago, I guess. Well, 51. 51 years ago. Yeah, yes. It's turned 68, so. What have I learned during that time? <laughs> The Our, owls told me I had to never stop learning and to teach that that was why I'm here. Right. So I've, I've tried to fulfill that. Awesome. Ah, it's a noble path. Noble path. I think you've done a good job <laughs> with that. So if you're just tuning in, this is uh, Blaine, the Herb Man, and Druzik, and uh, Wild Wisdom and Storytelling. We've been getting together every week. And uh, yeah, just chatting, letting the conversation go where it goes. Uh, we've covered so many different topics and ground. So if you're just watching for the first time or the second time, the third time, the fourth time, hey, we got 16 other episodes for you to dive into. Rarely do we ever uh, kind of circle back on things that we've uh, talked about before. Well, and if we need to, because our, our days of walking around outside, because we've done some field trips yeah. on, on the program, the show, what should I call this? Um, <laughs> Um, I, I still feel like we're on live TV when we do this, but um, um, I have a lot of images, like hundreds of images we could always, for anything that I have digitized, because in my day I was always shooting color slides, and uh, that's what magazines wanted, to go directly to color separations, they were called, I think, in that day, but hmm. now everybody's working with digital stuff, right? So, yeah. but anyway, I, I have thousands of things we could scan in order to put them in somehow. Can you can you do that? Yeah, we could do with that. With your te yeah. technology? Yeah, a little kind of like a PowerPoint almost, and slideshow, like a virtual plant walk. We could do that. That would be awesome. Yeah. As, as the weather shifts, uh, here we are. This is uh, kind of late November uh, 2023. And uh, weather's still nice, but... Uh, it's supposed to go up to 12 or 13 today, but I'm looking outside and there's just a very light flakes dropping out there. Yeah. So... Yeah. Anyway. Plants are out. So we had a good weekend. Um, there was the Canadian Herb Conference, uh, online event that happens every year. Uh, some years I'll be fortunate enough to present uh, but otherwise, it is really just this exposition of, of all this knowledge uh, from the herbal community. and uh, Coast to coast. Yeah, coast to coast. Absolutely amazing. Uh, some great guest speakers, and it's kind of all day, every day uh, for three days. There's panels, there's little discussion rooms going on, uh, all virtual, of course. And uh, there's keynotes, there's little mini workshops. Uh, they do a fantastic job. Uh, the three organizers, uh, well, I think there's a fourth as well, um, that uh, every year pull this together. So, uh, Blaine, this was your first time. You know, we've done these herbal conferences in person, but uh, this was your first time doing the online right. uh, version. And, uh, yeah, what was kind of your takeaway? What was your experience like? Um, any gems you want to share from, from what you Well, learned? it was just very nice that on uh, a particular topic there might be uh, four people on the screen. Um, and one's from South Africa, and one's from um, somewhere in Europe, and one's from America. And, and they had drastically different opinions at times. Um, or, uh, I, I know, I used to go through this with um, Linda Codnar, right. where if we were on a panel somewhere, um, uh, that's how we became friends, actually, was was there was all sorts of different events that would happen. And, mm -hmm. and if we saw each other, oh, Linda's going to be uh, and and she oh, Blaine's going to be because whichever one went first, yeah, we typically had almost the same things to say. Right. So if Linda <laughs> went first, I had to go up further to what Linda was saying. Blah blah blah. But yeah. you know we had to kind of think quickly on our feet. Right. So I, I think some of that happened with our panelists. Right. You know yeah, where yeah. you know they they were maybe going to cover the same stuff. So, but um, I, you know it brings me back to this point where I can attend something like that, or in this case, just watch, it's virtual, but, and it brings me back to this point of after all of the time I've spent working with particularly Western Canadian plants, um, it's back to that, this is how much I really know. Yeah. You know, after, 
Well, if we start with my running away to the wood strip, I, I had no idea I'd be a practitioner back then, but it's, it's been 50 years since I've been working with wild plants. Amazing. And Yeah. Well, that's great. You know, and that's exciting, isn't it? Because like, wow, there's still so much more to learn. It's still interesting. It's still it's engaging. A, it's a big pool. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, actually, before we hit record, uh, you mentioned that little fact about arnica, which I totally love, which is it's the one plant that you have taught for years that I can't scientifically, medically, or any other form of education explain how it works. <laughs> like anything else that we talk about, whether it's dried herbs or wild plants or essential oils, I can, I can fully um, describe the, how it functions. Right. But arnica, it just works. I mean, I, <laughs> I don't, um, I, I've had people, uh, because I include so many personal stories in my, in my classes, um, I've had people um, maybe say to a friend who attended the event, say, oh, how was your workshop with Blaine this weekend? Well, <laughs> um, I'll tell you one thing. If I'm ever walking in the woods with that guy, I'm going to stay at least 100 yards away at all times because he <laughs> seems to have the worst luck imaginable. You know, I say, no, 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 no. It's just like... If you work with more top power tools, you're going to get cut eventually. Right. You know, yeah. But um, of all the days and years and you know accumulated time that you've spent out there, of yeah. course, you could have some stories where accidents happens. happens. Yeah. And you get to practice your. Uh, well, actually, um, a younger brother of a dear friend of mine. It was at a, a Christmas event at, at their parents' home, and I was talking about something, and and I, I said that. What you just slipped in, mm -hmm. shit develops. Uh, oh, sorry, shit happens. Yeah. And he kind of went, no, no, Blaine, shit develops. Oh. And that's where I thought, you know, the real, real first aid is looking at somebody doing something stupid right. and stopping them <laughs> and saying, you shouldn't do things that way because ultimately you're going to hurt yourself. Right. So just avoid any. A event where you need first aid, right? Uh, by just real first aid is just doing things the right way. Yeah, and um, reminds me of the old saying about luck. You know that luck is actually you know preparedness meeting opportunity. Yes. Well. So anyway, there's things like arnica we were just talking about is one of the ones that, whether I'm a klutz or unlucky or just happen to put myself in the woods a lot and work with power tools a lot yeah. um, um, that I never want to have too far away because it does its best work if you use it immediately. So I'm talking about uh, going from early on with Arnica. If I was up a ladder and hit my thumb with a hammer, I might go, oh, when I get off the ladder for coffee break or something, I'll go find the Arnica. But uh, over time, I realized, no, get off the ladder right now right. and use it immediately. And then at the end of the day, you won't even remember which thumb you hit. Right. You know, because it works that well. Cool. So. And it's one of those herbs, like, you've got choices and it's preparation, too. You can have the homeopath, you can have the tincture, you can have the, you know, the salve, the cream, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. So, but uh, one you don't want to take internally, correct? Well, because we didn't know exactly how it worked. Right. And it was just... Another thing on that note, depending on who you're reading from, um, a, a lot of authors would say, you must use Arnica Montana. Mm -hmm. Now, we have several species yeah. um, in Alberta. Uh, there's one, for example, called Lake Louise Arnica. Really? Guess what? It only grows around Lake Louise. You know, it's... <laughs> yeah. But some of them... I, I think sometimes the way species develop, they, with morphing, like the one that I mostly use is Arnica cordata, which is in the foothills, because that's where I spend a lot of time. Yeah. Um, but if you look at that plant in every detail, it's identical to Arnica montana. Right. So as far as I'm concerned, why wouldn't it work? Like it's just a miniature version, because up on the high s slopes and, and plateaus, there's, there's a short growing season. So yeah. it doesn't, you don't, it didn't, doesn't have time to get, you know, 20 inches high. So Arnica Montana is typically about 10 inches high at best. Yeah. Smaller flowers, just, it's a miniature version. But um, uh, so it, whenever I had the chance, uh, people like you just mentioned, Robert Rogers, uh, and I'm trying to remember, oh, Michael Moore. Oh, yeah. That had the Southwest School. Um, yeah. People like that would say, yeah, 
it all they all work because that was my opinion. Right. Uh, and I would use locally. We had primarily cord. What did I just say? Cordata. Cordata. Yeah. And then another one called Latifolia, that would grow at the lowest elevations and around. Um, I would always find it kind of on on the hillside, the slopes along riverbanks. Yeah. But there's another one, and I'm forgetting the the Latin on it that I did find out around Medicine Hat area, like there's a prairie version Oh wow! that I did find a couple of times uh, hmm. when I was doing uh, walks around Medicine Hat. So I guess oh. I've worked with three. Yeah. I mean, the classification of plant species is challenging. I mean, I, I learned this diving deep into the world of, of cacao, uh, the obroma cacao, of which originally there was two camps of like, ah, there's actually two varieties. And oh, no, there's three. Okay, maybe there's four. Well, there's 12. Well, there actually might be, you know, easily over 100. Uh, and another thing they discovered was like how much, you know, and, and you and I have talked about this before, how much the environment plays a role on, on influencing it, its genetics and, it, and yeah. its expression. Yeah. So, yeah, okay, we can, you know, do we really start, you know, classifying so it all differently? So when we look at how our indigenous people used any of the, the plants from coast to coast, some of the, the uses are quite different. Now, is that because the environment's different right? and the chemicals in the plant are different? Yeah. Or is it just that different people were, were guided or stumbled over using the plant in different ways? Yeah. But or, it's... Or both. It's the thing that, and we've sort of touched on this a little bit, that like, I don't know anybody, self-included, that has free access to high-pressure liquid chromatography. So... No, you know, if you, entire, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you, d you don't know even in your own backyard in the same garden how much difference the soil has changed because of minerals being used up. Yeah. You know, or the difference right. in, I, I can remember as a child, my mother always had a big garden and sometimes it would be a dry summer and we'd be up at the cabin a lot. And, and nobody was watering the garden, and you'd get these peas that got really big, and they were hard as rocks and bitter yeah. from the same seeds. Right. That last year you had these delicious peas that, with a, a rainy season, you could almost eat the pods, like the little Chinese yeah. peas, you know? Yeah. So what's happening chemically there, and as far as, as, far as folk medicine goes, yeah. Um, it's kind of, it could be a hit and miss thing, you know. Maybe we're kidding ourselves that you read something in a book and right. expect the herb to work a certain way. Yeah, yeah. And then we get into the energetic part too, where how connected were the plants when you were picking them? Right. You know, and and that was yeah. Uh, on one of the occasions, I don't think I brought this up, but um, I was going back. There was a place that. Um, uh, just to be polite, um, uh, my first wife had gotten uh, permission to pick Artemisia frigida, which is the one that I used for smudging. Yeah. Um, and it's the best one locally for tapeworms. Right. Um, and uh, just if it was okay. So there was this nice place with a beautiful location on a, on a high bank overlooking the Bow River. And so. There'd be hawks, occasionally an eagle fly by, yeah. and you could hear some rapids below, and it was almost meditative to pick them there. So, so I was there once with her, and the next year, because I, I used it for my classes, um, the last thing we would make on the um, uh, herbal, herbal pharmacy course, we'd do some smudge last, mm -hmm. because I've always been sensitive to the pollen. So... Uh, I can make tincture and use it. I can make macerated oil with and use it. You know, I could smoke it, I guess, like smudge it. But it's the fresh pollen right. that makes me go from crystal clear to almost half a cup of snot coming out of my face yeah. after two hours of picking. It's an extreme reaction, right? And if I got scratched, uh, it would it would rash up. Right. So, anyway. Um, Three years in a row I went with the girls and then all of a sudden they weren't ready and I was going to go back to the same site and she was getting ready for work in the morning, finishing her hair and makeup and stuff. And I go, okay, honey, I'll see you for dinner tonight. Yeah, I'm going to make the blah, blah, woof, woof. And she said, don't forget to ask. 
And I said, well, you know what I do? I thank the valley and creator and everybody at the end. She said, no, 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 you gotta, you gotta ask every plant. Right. And I, yeah. come on, I'm, I'm gonna fill a big cooler with them. I'm gonna ask every plant. So you gotta ask every plant. So I go up to this hillside and I'm standing there looking around. There's about a thousand plants within view. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes I drop into my Cree my Cree friends when I'm thinking, or maybe I was a Cree warrior in a lifetime, you know, when I drop into my aid, you know, how much does that dog weigh? Well, how much would it weigh if you fed it once in a while? You know, so anyway, sometimes I, I kind of drop into my, that spirit form. But yeah. Does anybody here want to come to the city and help people learn about spirit? And the one right in front of me, oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah, sure, I'll come. Yeah, what's your blame? Yeah, okay, yeah, I'll come with you, blame. And, and right away, this one over here was saying, yeah, 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 take me too. And oh, don't leave me here. And and these plants, for quite some distance, were cheering and said, come on, pick me. Right. Like I swear, I was you know hearing this psychically somehow. Yeah. And um, at the end of it all, leaving with this full soft-sided cooler, as opposed to having any amount of guilt for how much herb I was taking from that hillside, yeah. um, I was sad in a way that I couldn't take more because I was helping them. They're right. perennial anyway, they're gonna come back. Yeah. Um, but I was helping them fulfill their destiny. Amazing. You know, and the oddest thing was when I came back the next year, they welcomed me. I went yeah. to exactly the same site yeah. and I, I could hear the plants rusting, saying, Blaine's back. And, and so, that's, that was one of the, the things that opened the door for me to what we call plant spirit communication. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. and, and once, it's kind of like seeing auras. Maybe some of you do now, but it's, it's a fairly simple thing with some guidance for the first time to have somebody just do a little exercise. It helps if you have an all white or an all black background as opposed to some modeled curtains or something. Right. But, um, to just stare at another human being, and it's just a little bit of a Zen thing or a little bit meditative. Yeah. And you can see, for me, it looked almost like when you get whatever the energy is coming off the highway on a really sunny day when it's hot, yeah. and you get that little wave thing that's about three feet high on the road ahead of you. Yeah, totally. It was kind of like that. Some of the right. women in the workshop saw colors, Yeah. Uh, but we took turns doing each other. And, oh, cool. Um, yeah, and just with some proper ins, um, that worked for me. Yeah. I don't walk around looking at auras every day, but I think I'm... Yeah, if you can drop into the right state and, yeah. Sometimes maybe I'm doing it subconsciously when I can tell from across the street whether a tree's healthy or not because of their aura. Right. But I've, I've never seen colors like some people do. Yeah. Anyway, um, so there's all these ways of communicating with the plants and and harvesting them correctly, I, I think you should have, if, I mean, there's places you can't pick, like parks, especially national parks. Yeah. Um, it would be nice if you got permission. But the parents and, told me I could. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> oh, that for a legal and, defense. And I, I think, uh, I think uh, it's nice to take a gift. Yeah, offering If it's back. a landowner. Right. And I've done that with people uh, Comfrey, for example, the right. people have seen me uh, doing a show or something like this, and they've got a backyard or an acre full of Comfrey, and they don't do anything with it. Yeah. In fact, they didn't know that you could do anything with it. For them, it's the worst weed on the property. Right. And um, and they say, well, come and take all you want. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to take some of my creams and salves and um, yeah. um, concentrated extracts and things like that with me and, yeah. and take the time to if they're interested, you, you don't want to be pushy, but if they're interested to show them, and most people are, you know, oh, thank you so much. We didn't know this was useful stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, um, and that's being of service to the plant. It was uh, Michael Pollan, uh, kind of famous New York Times food writer. A lot of his books been turned into documentaries. Uh, he, oh, I'm sure it wasn't an original thought, but the premise that, you know, like, you know, the grasses especially, you know, like who domesticates who, you know, like the grasses have been one of the most successful species of aligning with humans 
to corn on the cob. Yeah, propagate them, right? Like how many corners of the earth has this species, you know, spread as a successful propagation because of aligning with humans that go about the work of, you know, planting and weeding and tending and trimming and, you know, like taking care of the species. So you know, I, I often reflect on that too, of just like, okay, what role can I play in the, you know, the promotion of this species, even just people's awareness. Here we are talking about this plant uh, that might inspire others to, you know, value it, plant it, use it, so on and so forth. Yeah. So. so when I hear back from people that have tried um, a herbal remedy and say that it just didn't work for them, right? Um, sometimes I wonder how good the product was that they got. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but in a lot of cases, people have used, just with something like a common cold even, Yeah. they've gone to the remedy too late right. or not used enough. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a dosage thing yeah. or, you know, they wait too long, mm -hmm. uh, just with common things like echinacea. Yeah. Know? Yeah, and then kind of in the, maybe this gets into a little bit of the realm of like placebo in that sense of just like aligning with the spirit of the plant, you know, in that sense of like, you know, uh, many herbalists, I'm sure you have some stories about this too, kind of, you know, uh, and what I mean by aligning is, you know, that could be just, ah, spirit of echinacea, da, 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 you know, saying a little prayer before you pop a capsule of it. You know, even to, you know, uh, planting it or going out and harvesting it, asking for permission. There's a lot of studies that suggest that is a very real thing, um, that the plant can change its chemistry uh, to, you know, more better support you, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a frequency thing. Yeah, it's a frequency thing. So, you know, coming back to that question of, you know, classification, do all herbs work the same? I mean, there's so much at play. Uh, you even mentioned the idea, so, okay, intention, you know, I think that that's very real, uh, you know, what a plant can do. And Stephen Harry Buner is one that's like, we shouldn't put plants in such a box, you know, of like, this does this, right? It's like, they're, you know, it might, but, you know, yeah. like, it could do, you know, 50, 70 other things, you know. And that's know. the sort of thing that came up quite a bit on the, at the conference this weekend. Oh, very cool. Listening to people from several countries all over the world that use the same herb. Yeah. Some of which I use in ways that I never thought of. I didn't know that, could, that was good for that or whatever. Oh, really? Right. You know, it can do, oh, it can do that too. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, and it's kind of like humans, you know? Like if you meet somebody, you know somebody in a certain context, like, okay, yeah, I kind of I, I kind of know who Blaine is. I know who Denis is. Like they're both funny guys. They're both into plants, you know? But then there's always another side, you know, to you, to Denis. Like there's there's a dynamicness yeah. to... The biggest part for me with that would be meeting somebody on a herb walk camp at weekend or something. Yeah and then running into them downtown in a suit. Right. You might not even recognize them, you know, just walk no. right by them, you know? Yeah. Because we had their, let's call it their hippie. Right, yeah. Their hippie suit on, and then they had a business attire. and Right. And they're even... And, and they're on their way to play, you know, violin in, in the, con, you know, uh, in the orchestra, right? Just like, right. wow, I didn't know that, that was a part of who you are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, environmental conditions, like we talked about, because you know plants, you know how they work, who they are, is their chemical factories. Um, there was an interesting talk we did at the shop last night. Uh, Brandon Warren, he was talking about alchemy, and uh, you know the heavens and the earth, and like the plant kingdoms are, you know, a mix between that. So versus like minerals, which are very fixed. Uh, you know, you think of rocks, you think of minerals. They're uh, very kind of set. They're, they're not fluid. They don't move. And plants are, and whereas animals, like we're all about that, that mobility and that motion, where plants are a little bit of both, right? They're rooted, you know, where they can't move, yet those aerial parts, there is that kind of fluidity and that motion and that movement. Um, and so when it comes to them protecting themselves, to adapting to their environment, they're pretty much rooted, they're fixed. Uh, but what they can do is, is they can respond uh, through chemistry, right? And, and we know that's if they have, you know, a, a predator or an insect or something like that, they change their chemistry uh, to adapt, you know, to create defenses or, or whatever they need in the situation. Yeah. And uh, that's what herbalists are, are utilizing. 
uh, in that regard. So depending on the season, depending on the soil, like you mentioned, you know, maybe there's certain minerals available or not, you know, that they're going to utilize. We know absolutely, with, even within our own bodies and of course within plants, you know, like, okay, you know, the presence or the absence of copper will have a whole cascade of effects, you know, on your immune system, just as one tip of the iceberg uh, example. So, of course, if we look at one plant growing in one area that, you know, has a mineral, doesn't have a mineral, yeah, it could have a whole cascading effect in terms of uh, what it, quote unquote, can or cannot yeah. do. And just a, a quick note on um, vitamins are very fickle. Right. They don't last long. So if you have some carrots that were harvested in Ontario two months ago and sat in a in a warehouse and then you bought them somewhere that they sat and then they've been in your fridge for a month now. Yeah. Um, don't count on very much <laughs> left for vitamins, right? Yeah. Where minerals are like rocks. Yeah. Essentially they are. So you can take a mineral or a plant with minerals in it and even incinerate it to a white ash and the minerals are still there. Yeah. Because they're, they're rocks. Yeah. So the shelf life is almost limitless. Right? That was part of what he was getting at in terms of like, you know, the ancient alchemists and what he practices. Uh, he'll, so if he makes a tincture, for instance, the spagyric, he says it's not so much, you know, what is a spagyric, but, you know, it's more about how. And that how includes one process, which is burning uh, the plant, the animal, or the in this case, metal or mineral, you know, down to an ash mm -hmm. and then adding in that salt. Right. Uh, which he says, like, kind of anchors a remedy. Whereas you take a normal tincture that maybe doesn't have it, hasn't been prepared that way without the salts, it can have an effect, but it just kind of moves through. And mm -hmm. so you need to take it again. Whereas the salt anchors those effects. He feels it's more building uh, in that And that, that's the word spagyric. Yeah. Right, S-P-A-G-Y, kind of like it sounds. Yeah. Uh, that you're kind of getting everything the plant had to offer. Right. When people have gone that far. Yeah, yeah. So you, you harvest the same, not the same batch, but you get some more of those carrots and, yeah. and, and um, incinerate those, but you need some fresh ones to make the tincture or whatever. Right. And then you put it all together again. Yeah, and so spirit, spagyric, if you break it down into two words, basically means to, you know, break apart and recombine. So totally fascinating. Love learning, eh? That's so and, great. and keep that in mind when you're shopping, looking at labels and comparing brands and whatnot. If this one is just a something extract and this one, if it's spagyric, it, it's worth twice the price kind right. of thing. Yeah. Because you know, a lot of engineering goes into it. Well, and his bottles, like, they're like that, right? They're the size of an essential oil bottle. And you're taking one drop or two drops at a time versus like droppers. So there's a time and a place for yep. both. And uh, yeah, when you talk about the vitamins, you know, minerals being fixed, you lose those vitamins. Uh, that's the role that fermentation can play because that brings all that life and vitality and nutrients in the form of vitamins back. It doesn't produce minerals, but it actually produces vitamins. You know, vitamin C goes up, vitamin B, all, all the vitamin Bs go up, you know, through fermentation. Yeah. We had a, a big thing that came up um, it's probably been two years already now. I'm, I'm really bad with time right now because I've been, since my big crash and, you know, being, it's almost three years now that I've been um, out of the loop. But I remember something that had come up uh, just before that, so let's say four years ago, was that if you take turmeric roots and grind them up and put it in capsules, uh, it has some effect on your joints, but it has to be extracted with hot oil that it has to be and guess what in Indian food right um, I would see somebody cooking traditional Indian food with things like mustard seeds and the turmeric and whatnot and they start cooking the dish with just oil in a pan and 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 cooking bringing the oil to a temperature where the seeds start yeah. popping and splitting right and that's where the the chemistry that we want in the turmeric is really going to help your joints. So, yeah. so that switched the whole market. And these days, most people are going to get turmeric in a gel cap. Right. And that's where the, the heat extraction in oil went into a gel cap. Right. So sometimes it, 
you know, we've been doing the wrong thing for years, and yeah. or things like calcium carbonate versus citrate and things like that. And, and they're all still on the shelf, and a lot of people don't know better, and there's a big jar of calcium carbonate, and you just don't absorb as much. Mm -hmm. It's like I, I used to, on opening night of, of courses, often take uh, in my pocket, I would have a couple of nuts and bolts, like from my workshop, not the ones that you snack on when you're wa watching a hockey game, <laughs> like real nuts and bolts. And I just say, is anybody here uh, anemic at all? Anybody iron deficient? And um, I might get a few people putting their hands up and say, well, yeah. oh, um, here, suck on these for a while. <laughs> You know, and people would look at me and say, "Well, what?" And I said, "Well, there's a lot of a lot of iron in, yeah. in, in nuts and bolts, you know. And where well, where do you get the freshest iron? Well, go to Hawaii and get some lava. Right. Now, now, don't use it when it's too fresh. You're going to burn your lips. But let yeah. it cool for a while. So, how much how much do you get out of the the like when you suck on some dried lava? Well, almost nothing. Yeah, but." If that lava gets broken over time to become soil, right? You know, and a plant like one that we use a lot for iron is ferric citrate that comes in raspberries, for example, raspberry tea, raspberry leaf tea, um, has a lot of ferric citrate in it, and it's in a form that you will absorb. Right. So you know, we always like to say that the the more life forms that a nutrient has gone through before you get it, right. probably the more absorbable it is. Yeah, totally. You know, it's like in, in the ocean, things go from, from ocean bed into um, plankton and whatnot, right. and the little fish eat that, to, and then the a krill, bigger fish uh, eats that, and, and it moves up the food chain. Yeah, yeah. And now, now it's, it's in the fish, or yeah, krill, for example. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, that's a big part of nutrition that a lot of people just have never been made aware of. Totally. So again, back to those kingdoms, like animal, vegetable, mineral, you know, like the vegetables are that uh, kind of that bridge for, for animals, uh, us. And of course, like you mentioned, we, we can eat the vegetables and we can eat the animals, you know, that are eating the vegetables that uh, have transformed the minerals. Yeah, and so... If I'm going to eat some farmed fish, right. I would like to know what they're feeding the fish with. Yeah. Because it makes a huge difference. You are what you eat eats. You can have, um, and I know that was something my old friend Tony Marshall with, um, uh, what's the company called again? Um, they were big on, he started with just flax oil, organic flax. Oh, um, Highwood? Yeah, Highwood Crossing, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, and when they press the oil, uh, cold press the oil out of the flax stuff, the mush that's left still has a lot of oil in it yeah. because the presses only work so well. Yeah. And I know that he was selling his mush to somebody that was selling it on to uh, fish farms. Oh. So it was going into fish food so that they were getting right. the right oils so that their omega-3 levels ah, were... Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You know, cause if you're going to farm something in an enclosed space, it's important that um, you're giving them the right nutrients. Yeah, totally. You know, and I had the first time I went out to the farm where I was getting my uh, free-range organic eggs and lamb and all that from. Yeah. Uh, the owners there, uh, the it was a man, his wife, and and his sister started this farm operation, and. Um, he was really proud to go show me uh, everything that goes into his chicken food. Right. He had a, all sorts of bins with a whole bunch of different nutrients and grains and things that w was, were all prepared a certain way. And he had, you know, like garbage cans full of different things and to make big batches at a time. Yeah. And uh, very proud of me to show there's garlic and several herbs and, you know, uh, yeah, very proud. So the food, that's what makes the eggs taste better and give you more nutrition. Totally. Than some other eggs, right? That's why I love permaculture, because when you're going to raise any type of food, plant or animal, you want to create it in a way as, as kind of as natural and wild as possible. And uh, yeah, so you do get all those inputs. Otherwise, we end up with our kind of modern industrial food system, which says, okay, well, we just need NPK, you know, because <laughs> that makes the plants go really big and look really good. But right. They're empty. They're devoid uh, most of the time. 
Well, that comes up a lot when I'm talking about alfalfa. Right, yeah. So an open prairie, if it's real dry, those plants will root as deep as 27 feet in the soil. Yeah. And they bring a whole bunch of trace minerals up from the deep soil to the surface. But if you're irrigating them, right. you know, they only root about this deep. Yeah. And back to your NPK story, that's all they get. Yeah. So um, when things like alfalfa sprouts became a big hit with the whole hippie generation and everybody, oh, you don't make sprouts? Like, depending yeah. on where your seed's coming from, um, it's going to make a big difference if, if, that, if those seeds came from an irrigated field and then you're just sprouting them in some tap water. Yeah. Like, you know, they're, they're crunchy and they taste good, but you're not getting... Yeah. You read a book that says there's all of these minerals in, right. in alfalfa. Well, in the plant, yeah. there is under the right growing conditions. Totally. But when you grow something in your kitchen cupboard, yeah. um, the, the, you know what I mean? It, yeah, that's why uh, for a number of years, actually my wife ran a sprout house when we were both living in Arizona. Uh, I was in the kitchen as a chef and training people, and uh, she was in the sprout house. And there, their standard practice was to use an uh, ocean mineral solution because uh, the, the ocean contains all minerals known and unknown, so you use that to grow your sprouts. Now they have that available to right. absorb, and uh, yeah, it makes all the difference. You know, down there, you know, they were trying. Uh, it was it was during my kind of vegan days, and uh, you know, there's this joke that there's actually no such thing as vegan farming. You, you can't do it, and it's it's that that whole cycle of like animal, vegetable, mineral, we talked about kind of the minerals getting kind of going up the food chain. Well, it takes the animals dying or pooping, you know, both yeah, ideally. For the fertilizer. Yeah, to Compost. go back into the earth to then nourish the plants. Uh, it's a whole cycle. And yeah, yeah you try and take <laughs> anything out of that equation. I watched a documentary recently that I really enjoyed. It was like New Ways of Dying. Oh, okay. And uh, one of them was uh, you can... You arrange a plot still, yeah. And this this woman has a, a, a nice uh, piece of land, and um, you you aren't buried in a coffin. You're shrouded in fabric, right? And you can still have a service, yeah. And then y y you um, they they don't bury you that deep. I forget a couple of feet. Um, and then they plant a tree right above you. Amazing. That's how <laughs> and, I want to go. And, <laughs> yeah, well, me too. I just want, like for me, just there's a couple of particular forest areas that I hope somebody will get to and spread my ashes because they're, yeah. they're places where I had my best times of yeah. my life were in the forest. So um, you don't have to do it fancifully. Just go out there and get them into just maybe a windy day if you're on the right side of the wind uh, will help you just... Totally. Just dust them. I don't care. Yeah, but, you know. I, I I really truly hope that is a viable thing because I've heard and maybe you know about this is that like you can't actually be buried any other way. Like your typical most bodies are. So if you're cremated, which is one thing, and if this is true, what I'm about to say, that's why I would go cremation to avoid this whole step. Is that if you're buried, you're embalmed, basically like formaldehyded, so yep. your body doesn't break down. Typically, you've got a cement, you know hole that you're put into so you really you don't go back into the earth you know like not maybe i don't know how many hundreds or a thousand years like later yeah okay you'll yeah. you'll eventually get there but we do everything to you know prevent ourselves from entering back into the cycle so currently i'm on the cremation side of things but i would way rather be inoculated with mycelium and <laughs> drop just a foot or two below the soil and uh yeah, a tree planted on top. That's that's how I want to go. So we'll we'll see. Hopefully, things things are changing. You know, right? ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Right. <laughs> yeah. And in the meantime, while we're alive, got to make the most of it, right? And then we could say, "This is Malcolm Rishi." <laughs> really? No, I'm serious. This is Malcolm Rishi. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. We always joke about that for like various like new health food products you know like uh so that that could be a new one right it's like this is the reishi that grew from blame you know like just think of all the all the intelligence and all the minerals and all the you know consciousness infused into this reishi mushroom and I, not everybody would believe you i would i would drink your reishi tea okay thank you <laughs> goes both ways yeah
plenty. And there's probably legal things involved there, too. Yeah, yeah. You certainly can't go bury yourself in a city park or something. No, no, it's true. It, probably not even backwoods. Yeah, it's an unfortunate thing. It's birth and death are so, you know, uh, when we went and saw Stephen Jenkinson, um, man who wrote a number of books, Die Wise, that type of thing. I mean, that's been his whole thing. It's like kind of the med medical institution has really like captured both birth and death. Um, yeah, I mean, I've tried to break out of that. I've had much more experience with birth uh, than I have death. You know, having home births with both of my children, um, that's something that's a little bit more open and accessible uh, for people to, yeah, experience and be a part of in, in a home environment. But most of the time, it's very kind of like in a hospital, medicalized, and probably even more so uh, with death, and, and especially what happens afterwards, too. Uh, to the to the body, everything has almost gone through the same sort of shift, development, whatever, as our use of plants. Hey, like you know, I mean, in the old days, like my own ancestors would have been born on a farm somewhere, right? Maybe with one of the neighbors helping or something. Yeah. And now, a, a lot of modern women would be, although we've got more and more. It's been growing during our careers of. People mm -hmm. having home births, like you said, and with a, using a doula and yeah. and this whole process. And again, it was it was just a couple generations there, yeah, where we went through a lot of modern women would be terrified of the thought of having their baby at home because there's yeah. too many things that could go wrong, and you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, but. Um, well, and, and now, I mean, you hear about the, a country like Brazil, which apparently has the highest rate of C-section, you know, okay, well, you know, it works in my schedule. How about we book it in on Thursday, at, you know, 3 p.m. kind of thing, the doctor's available, you know, like I'll have the day off kind of, it's like, it becomes this, you know, of a lifestyle that's, convenience. That's that, horrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it's 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 unfortunate for sure. Uh, another thing that's happening in within the kind of the birthing industry. So yes, there there is a rise in industry. Time. Yeah. Gosh. <laughs> With doulas and midwives, uh, you know. Okay. Yeah, and um, from my understanding, so I I have two children. They were born quite a far apart. Like the first one was at a time where we had to have a midwife, paid out of pocket, wasn't supported by the government. Uh, second child, yeah, you get a, get a midwife, it's covered, so on and so forth. Uh, there's still a huge demand for them. There's still not enough of them. Mm. But what's happened is um, as it is becoming more of an institutionalized profession, uh, only a certain type of women gets into that program because you got to have, you know, X, it's so hard to get into. you got to have like the top highest grades uh, which is great, but you know, it's a certain type of thinking. It's a certain type of person that's going to have those grades to get into that uh, yeah, yeah, profession. Yeah. More kind of analytical, more you know, so on and so forth. Versus maybe who's somebody who's not so intellectual, smart, but really has that more like motherly intuition. I'm not saying the analyticals don't, but uh, this has come as a as a bit of a concern and a and a criticism to how the system is is set up. That there's a lot of very, very highly qualified women uh, that could and should uh, be midwives, but they just can't get through those institutional yep. hoops uh, to get into the field, and we're only getting a certain uh, way and thinking of, of a type of person doing that job now, unfortunately. Well, that's how I feel about nursing right? in general. You yeah. know, that like some nurses are just, they really care and they're excellent and something that, whether you're in pain or just getting a, an injection of something. Mm -hmm. um, like it's not that long ago that one of the nurses, um, I had something come up with, I forget what it's called, where, uh, did I have too much iron? Is it, is it hypernemia? I can't remember what it was called. Where the only way to get rid of it was to actually give blood. Oh, okay. So yeah. I had to go in a couple of times where they drew a half liter of blood from me or something like that. Right. And the first time I went in, I had, it was somewhat painful getting started, and I had massive bruising right. on my arm. And, and the second time I was in, well, you know, I mentioned that, and 
And then I said, well, didn't, didn't she do this and this and this and this and this? And I said, no. And she said, oh, well, that's just barbaric. <laughs> and she had me wrapped up in a, in a right. warm towel first and everything, and we just relaxed. And I, you know, I put a little bit of arnica on later, and I didn't have any bruising at all. Amazing. You know, the same process, same, yeah. you know, same qualifications. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I know we've talked about this before, you know, the idea of, like, harmonizing the, the head and the heart, that there's two ways of knowing, two ways of being, and, you know, we've overemphasized the kind of the intellectual pursuit, the rational mind, which is great, it's wonderful, but, you know, at, at the detriment of, of more of that kind of sensitive side, the intuitive side, and wouldn't it be great if there was, like, okay, what are your, uh, what do they call them in the, in the States, like, your PSAs, you know, like, what's your intellectual scoring, but right. what's, your, what's your EQ like, you know, like, what's your level of intuition you know like who knows like can you see auras you know <laughs> what type of color uh, do you get from this man over here um, one of the experiences I had with uh, what you're describing like again it's sometimes just intention putting yourself in the right state being open to as you had shared seeing an aura uh, Stephen Buhner one of his workshops he talked about how he had just recovered from about a pneumonia his lungs were quite weak and he just, without any prompt, you know, uh, giving it away, he asked everybody, he's like, you know, in the room, there must have been about 50 of us, like, you know, just, just tune in, focus in on my lungs, like, and, and just tell me, you know, which lung was it? And the vast majority, like, that one, right? Oh, good, I got good. it, right? Like, just yeah. like, a, it's again, it's that aura, there was just this sense, this presence of like, okay, that one just... It's not like I could see his lungs, but there was something kind of emanating through that yeah. I could like tell. I suppose one could argue, well, you had a 50% chance of getting that right, but most of the room got, you know, chose the right one and there was, a, there was an interpretation, there was a sensing into uh, which one it was. And uh, he was obviously very confident in doing that exercise, knowing that you know, humans, we have that capacity, we have that ability to, to perceive. Um, and I think that's, that's really lacking in our, in our society. For some reason, I just flashed to a documentary that I watched a couple of years ago about Winston Churchill. And a couple of guys were arguing about whether or not he should even be the prime minister and that sort of thing, and he's good or he's bad or whatever. And, and one of the men said, well, Bill, come on, even a dead clock is right twice a day. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I, yeah. I really like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, when it comes to odds and things. Yeah. But um, yes, it's been an interesting time, and it feels so good to be part of it. Yeah. To getting people back to. It's only been a couple of generations, you know. Like. Yeah. We've had people yeah. come from different parts of the world, and. Um, Wasn't it Terry that said, uh, you know, the world is growing more herbalist right now? Yeah. You know, there, yeah. there's this resurgence. I talked to a woman last night, you know, and her husband was questioning her, like, why do you keep pursuing all this? You know, like, why don't you just go buy it? You know, like, you don't need to learn how to make a tincture. And it's like, no, there's, there's real value. And, and for her, one of the highest values that came out of there is like, I want to know this to be able to pass this on. Like, otherwise, we're going to lose all these skills. We're going to lose this ability. And that's really important. Like making pickles. <laughs> yeah. And right. I'm, I'm so glad that you've made that part of your career, is yeah. that, um, um, and, and you know a lot more about the health benefits of fermentation than any of my ancestors did. They just did it because grandma, that was their way of harvesting food in the fall. Right. You know? Yeah, totally. They didn't know what you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, they might have done it for a practicality or preservation and they enjoyed the flavor, but. Yeah. They weren't talking about microbiomes. No, no. <laughs> um, so. And that, that's where that kind of, that's okay. You know, we can yeah. fill in those blanks. Uh, and that's why I love the Arnica story. I love that there's still mystery out there. You know, like we still use Arnica, even though we can't scientifically explain why it works. Doesn't matter, you know, like, and... I, in, in this moment, I celebrate that. Like, great, there's still a mystery. We haven't, like, you know, pinned it down to, and there's still a, you know, belief based upon experience, you know, we're still going to use it. We're still going to go with it, even if we can't, yeah, rationally explain it. And while picking the flowers, um, if you pick an arnica flower and lift it to your nose, there's, there's very little smell there. 
that after picking the flowers for a couple of hours, you smell your fingers, it's just angelic. Mm. There's this incredible fragrance there, right? Yeah. But, you know, while harvesting, because I'd be in the foothills harvesting, right? I'm, I'm making macerated oils and tincture commercially to sell in my business. Yeah. So um, I would try and focus while picking on battered women, Olympic athletes, you know, like some right. of the people that most likely will use this product. Right, yeah, yeah. Where is it going? And, and ah. that would just keep my heart in a good place. Ah, totally. As opposed to thinking about money. Yeah, I mean, that comes right back to what we were talking about uh, earlier in this conversation, you know, infusing with intention. Uh, and I think that is you bringing your energy, your thoughts, your intention, but, you know, maybe it helps kind of align and elevate, you know, the plant to... There was only one person that I've ever had helping me um, that I, I guess, fired because she would always show up in some sort of bad mood right. and whatever. And I, I just, uh, sorry, darling, but yeah, I just don't want you pouring my oils. Yeah, no, you know? totally. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I credit some of my success and why, you know, there's many reasons, but, you know, one of them was uh, Denis, you know, like he was... Second employee ever hired, uh, longest running man that I continue to work with to today. I mean, you know, he started on the shop floor. He would repack, do all kinds of jobs. Always happy. Yes, always, always just magic. <laughs> always infused, like, you know, like, oh, la, la, la. Like he's filling the bags and like that comes through. Not only did it yeah. literally fill the store with like joy. Um, uh, whenever I visited your store, um, it's just, you just feel blessed to be there you just walk in yeah and the energy level is just elevating mm -hmm. and you just don't get that at Safeway sorry yeah. Safeway but it's just true you know and yeah, yeah and um and there's people that would enter your store with a list of things because they have health issues so their energy is low but mostly so your clientele have an above average energy too yeah. Because of all the things you're supplying with them. So, yeah. you know, walking into your store is always, just, I just stop as soon as I walk in the door and, <laughs> and just smile. You just, you can almost taste it, you know? Yeah. It, yeah. Well, I think the key word is, is light, you know? You know, light uh, in terms of bright, uplifting. Light and bright and love. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a good path. And, uh, you know, why, why have it any other way? I mean, that's always been my choice. Sometimes you can't control these things, but, you know, in the creation of my own life and the kind of the unfoldment of the business, it's like, hey, we, we get to choose, you know? Like, let's, let's make it the best ever. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, we had a good chat, covered lots of ground. Didn't know where we were going to go today. We originally thought that maybe we might dive into uh, first aid. Would you like us to dive into first aid um, next next week? That's something that we can uh, cover off. And uh, that's a course you've actually taught, you know, a number of times in the past. So if that's a workshop uh, that anybody's interested in, let us know down below. There's lots of uh, ways and avenues and things that we can uh, really get into. So. And it's, you know, you have to sort of have at least three kits because it's, you got the big one that can stay at home and the one that lives in the trunk of the car and then the one that you're going to take backpacking. Right, yeah. You know, so you have to, I've had a number of people come to see me before they were world trotting somewhere. Yeah. <clears throat> Especially, you know, places like India and whatever. And uh, what would, well, Blaine, what would you take if you were going there? And I go a little bit, and I got this pile of stuff on the table. Uh, no, cut it in half. Blah, 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 blah. Um, it's still too much because we're going to be backpacking for two months. Right. You know, and it's like <laughs> cut it and cut it down, cut it. And it's like I've had to deal with that sometimes editing for a magazine article. Right. I, yeah. You know, I here's here it is. This is what I want to say about sunscreens. And. No, Blaine, we told you we just want 500 words. Uh, so, you, you know, start cutting. But but this all matters. I have to have a thousand. No, no, <laughs> 500 words, such a, you know. And so, um, yeah, back to basics. Uh, 
Yeah. And that's a thing that, this was a big part of this workshop, just this weekend with people from all over the world. Um, fear exists and I think it's rational fear. Um, governments all over the world, especially ours, you know, we went through a whole shift a few years back. Um, I went to some of the biggest meetings when the whole thing was started, and there were times when I'd, I'd have gone with a friend, and the government was looking at, they, they, would, they would have charts of what they considered large, medium, and small businesses, and the small businesses wouldn't even be close to what I would be doing, right. or like sometimes I would go with, I'll say Ray Dunphy, some of you, you knew her, she's gone now, but we would just look at each other and say, why are we here? Right. You know, they're obviously, not, they don't care about us being here because yeah. to them a small business is, you know, so many million dollars a year and, you know, 20 employees and how many square feet and that's a small business. Right. We're, like we're working out of our homes, really. Yeah, you're like, you know, a, like not a maker. A, a home lab. And nano. Like, why are we here? They don't, none of this even seems to apply to us. But... Um, uh, it's pretty scary right now. Like you're going to face some difficulties, I think. Oh, totally. And and some of the formulas that we've made, there's a few skin creams and things like that that I've made mm -hmm. that are just going to be gone. And and I had a lot of fans. Yeah. Of those products, but they're going to be gone forever. Yeah. Um, because um, some of the licensing fees and things like that are. Oh, it's insane. Totally uh, they've insane. just. Yeah. More than quadrupled, hey? Like, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because when we first got the NPNs, they were, oh, I think they were free even for a year or so right. when they started. And then they, they had a small fee. Right. But now those fees are just through the roof. Yeah. So they are proposed what they want to bring in. Uh, some of them didn't even exist before. They've got brand new fees, you know, like a labeling fee. A distribution fee, an importation fee. A check your labeling fee. Yeah, yeah, right? And then if you want to do an amendment, oh, darn, I, you know, ended up have I switched that formula or I'm going with a different version of XYZ, now I have to reapply and, you know, there's the amendment fees and all that kind of thing. So, I mean, this comes back to, you know, the woman last night, you know, when her husband's like, why are you learning all this stuff? Why don't you just go buy the tincture? Well, you might not be able to buy some of these things. Uh, coming up in future, so it, it's always good to have that within yourself. Uh, there were a few of the, um, I'm, not a, I'm not trained in Chinese herbal herbology, herbalism, but there was certain formulas that I've learned about over the years. Yeah. Um, and some of them went missing for a while when the whole NPN thing came out. Right. And then a couple of years later, they were back on the shelf at twice the price. Right. Um, but at least they were back. Yeah. But um, those were coming from really large companies. Yeah. They weren't people that were making small. Yeah. So on, on that note, something that's always the niche that makes me somewhat comfortable has always been that if I'm making, if Malcolm came to see me for, for a consultation, for some health issues, and we went through, we'd have a talk, and I would do iridology and all of these things, and um, maybe I'm gonna custom make a blend for him. Uh, that's called formulating. And formulating has always been left free. Yeah. Okay, so because the, the consideration is, I have, hopefully I know what I'm making, what I'm using, and explain the ingredients to him, and that's why the dosage is this much. Don't overuse it. Right. Um, and, and so we, we discuss all of that one to one. So away he goes with his distinctly unique product. But as soon as you put all that in a bottle right. to put on a shelf where any consumer that doesn't know anything about anything, yeah. they may have trouble finding their car, their car when they leave the building, you know, that sort of consumer, um, <laughs> you have to have all of this stuff on a label. Yeah, and one of the classes I was at, or meetings I was at, was it, for me it was really handy because it was a national meeting with the NHPD uh, that just happened to be at a hotel a few blocks from home. 
So I actually went home for lunch, um, where I didn't have to fly to Toronto. Right. So um, there was, at first I was confused that uh, one of the other attendees was from Lancome, like that's beauty products, oh, you know, right. skin creams and things. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, there were all sorts of businesses, but the Lancome girl and I had the same concerns about certain products. And at one point, I, I just couldn't make the point with them about they were showing, this is what you have to put on a bottle now. And they had this whole right. thing. And um, one of the people at my table just said, you must have something in your... So I, I actually took whatever I had handy. I think it was just some peppermint I usually have with me. I took a four mil vial of peppermint and went out and slammed it down on, I don't know why they still had an over, overhead projector there, but I remember slamming it on an overhead projector and, and just went, show me how. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, how do I get this on? The room stopped. Yeah. Like they just all froze. They just, right. they just didn't consider yeah. that some of the products that were going out there with, you know. So we got to this thing where you have to have a, um, a label that's, um, it's one of those uh, sealed on the outside and you tear it open with your thumb right. with about a scroll it out this long story <laughs> about how, why, and what it is and you know, where it comes from and all of that. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, something that we could sell for nine ninety five is now in a box with a freaking book in there. Yeah. And now it's 30 bucks a bottle. Yeah. No, and it's really, all it's worth is nine ninety five. dollars This is the problem with bureaucracy, right? They have no practical experience. They're just in some boardroom dreaming up these rules for these imagined threats. And, you know, I get it. Some of it is real, but not. I mean, uh, one of the cases, you know, f kind of the, on the for and against all this natural health regulation, uh, you know, those that are saying they're against it all, just like, show me the harm. Like, there's never been a death, you know, caused by natural health products. So why are you trying to regulate it? The same or like three a year in the country. If, if that. And if that. Yeah. And, and how well was it even studied and where did the product come from and all of that. Yeah, what were the where, circumstances? You know, we kill thousands of people a day. Yeah. Um, yeah, medically, pharmaceutically, and you say that they have equal risk. You know, therefore they need to be regulated the same. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just totally, in, totally insane. I, I, I'm not going to use a number because I haven't looked at that data for too long. Um, but it's scary how many people we kill with federally approved drugs yeah. in a year. Like it's for candidates in the millions. Yeah. It's a big number. It's huge. I mean, iatrogenicide, I think, is the third leasing cause of death, which is basically like, you know, your your medical professional, doctor, nurse, whatever, like, yeah, with through prescriptions, through surgery blunders and, you know, mm. yeah, yeah, that type of thing. Uh, it's massive. Um, just you know, doesn't even compare to what's going on uh, with people working with uh, natural remedies at home. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, this is something that, uh, and I'll just mention, um, you know, there's been a lot of buzz about it uh, over the last few months, uh, as there has been over the last kind of, you know, decades, and there was it was breaching uh, the MPs. They're like, yeah, this is one of the top things that's coming across our desk. It doesn't seem to be as much anymore. So, you know, if this kind of issue uh, uh, concerns you, you know, keep bringing it up, keep bringing it forefront. Uh, there's postcards you can send in, there's emails you can make, there's phone calls you can have, there's meetings, so on and so forth. Uh, it's definitely got their attention, but it's not as as pressing. I mean, I remember I was just over at mom's the other day and she'd gotten her little letter from her MP and it's like, here's the top issues, you know, that Canadians are raising. Whoosh, wasn't on there, uh, whereas just, you know, month two previous, uh, it had made the list. Yeah, and signing a petition or getting some of those pre-printed, what, what's, what's that SOS, those oh, cards are yeah, up? yeah, yeah, the little postcards. Um, sending stuff like that in is rarely a dent as opposed to an actual letter right. to your MP mm -hmm. so that those letters stack up because a lot of those you just sign them and put your name on them and date them and throw them in the mail. Yeah. Uh, those don't get very far. Yeah. I always think about the, um, at, the, at the exhibition in the fairgrounds every year when they came through town, they used to have that, uh, I don't know, maybe they still do, that thing where you're out with your girlfriend and 
you want to show off and you get this big hammer and you have to hit this thing and if right. you hit it hard enough the bell rings at the top and she gets a stuffy yeah, yeah. you know and if she doesn't you feel like a loser and you know we go <laughs> but um, does that do they still have those I think? Oh, I'm sure I they do yeah the odd yeah. carnival yeah yeah um, so it's kind of that's how business works politics work you got to have right. a whole lot of noise yeah to actually get to the top right no, it's true. Know, and, and make a difference. And the postcards will work in volume, right? When there is, like, we, they have to wheelbarrow them in. Like, oh, yeah, there's oh, one yeah, of yeah. those postcards. Yeah. Yeah. I guess we should address this. Right. <laughs> so I'm optimistic, but not without, you know, focus, work, diligence, and, uh, yeah, and ultimately integrating this in, into one's life, lifestyle, influencing others, uh, making it a norm. I think they're, they're trying to make this as like a fringe thing, but uh, yeah. So yes, make some noise. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in today, everybody. I hope you enjoy it. Give it a thumbs up. Share it with somebody who you know would benefit. And uh, we'll be back next week. Looking forward to uh, chatting more. Post any comments, questions down below. Maybe we'll do the first aid topic. Uh, who knows? We'll see. We'll see for next week. Yeah, first aid is, by definition, what to do until the doctor comes. And for some of us, and a lot of Canadians, adventure outdoors. Yeah. Um, I've, I've taken that to the point more extreme than most people would have, living in the forest alone for four months and things like that, or running some pretty big rapids when I've been on solo trips and things yeah. like that. So um, that was a big part of why I started to study. I had no interest whatsoever in ever becoming a herbalist. Right. And I certainly, when I started working with oils a lot, I had no interest at all in selling essential oils. Um, but it, it just sort of, I got pushed and shoved and led yeah. uh, into it and it, it kind of took over my life and became a career or more than a career, three careers. Yeah. Um, so I just, I was a whisper away from dropping what I was doing and it would have been medical school, medical school when I was about 20. Right. I was gonna go back to school and it would have been medical school. Huh. And um, I had always done exceedingly well in my uh, sciences, like in high school and whatnot, you know, top yeah. marks always. So I, I'm sure I could have pulled that off. Yeah. But. Um, uh, that's when I met Terry and just kind of got drawn a different way. You yeah. Know? But um, so first aid is what to do right away. But sometimes we need second aid. Right. So I've wanted to learn things like how to set a shoulder. Right. And um, how to do an emergency tracheotomy. It's a little different than the way they would do it in the hospital. Right. Um, and I've had some really close calls. You know, I've had some just things like there was a day where I was going down just a little slope and I was wearing moccasins that had no grips and um, uh, I'd, I'd just call it quits for a late day uh, deer hunting when I was quite young. And uh, my moccasins slipped and I went down and in, I was in about four feet of snow and there was a dead tree there with a bunch of broken branches on it. And one of them went right through my, my thigh. Wow. If it had been a half inch further over, I would have bled to death in about half an hour. Right, holy. You know, and, and I had to very carefully lift myself right. off like I was skewered. Wow. You know, um, so I've had some close calls and I... <laughs> Back to that comment. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'll keep 100 feet away from you if we ever go out to the woods. Or, um, or like there was, I remember when, this is really creepy, it's just a goofy thing. Um, uh, I was getting, I was setting up for one of the weekend camp out her walk things. Yeah. And our dear friend Dorothy, that's uh, Yero's mother, and she's been a, like a soulmate of mine for our whole lives and apparently past lives as well. And... Um, uh, she was in town and just had time and was more than happy to come with me to help like chop wood and get the camp all set up and everything. Yeah. And um, 
we, we had, I got all the, everything's tidied up and I got the split wood over there and the rounds over there and everything over there and then there was a, some kindling over there and there was, and I, I just kind of looked over and there was this uh, lodgepole pine branch that I, I just kind of looked around and said, how did, how did we miss that one? And, and I went over to just throw it onto the fire starter pile and it, it didn't come, which seemed odd to me, so I yanked it a little harder and um, it didn't come, so I yanked it even harder. And this huge branch came, it was buried under about four inches of dirt. It must have been from some camper, Lord knows how long ago. And this big branch flipped up and slammed me right in the face. Whoa. And I, oh, this isn't good. And I kind of lifted the branch away and um, uh, I went and looked in the truck mirror. They, they folded, sort of like folded the mirror away, and I, I looked in the truck mirror, and one of the, like, red dried for two years or longer, this lodgepole pine needle went right into my eye, eye, eyeball. Wow. Like, there was a couple in my eyelid and face, too, but there was wow. one that was right in my eyeball. And um, Dorothy is quite remarkable at just being as I am typically with such things, able to be really calm. Right. And, um, you know. Matter of fact, so, you've got a pine needle in your eye there. <laughs> yeah, and so she said, well, what do you want to do? And I, I thought about everything I still needed to get done and whether or not is this worthy of driving back into town to go to a hospital? Right. And uh, I remember looking over at a water bottle that I had that I knew had distilled water in it. And um, I said, I wish I had some German chamomile. And I didn't. So I thought I'm going to have to use just some lavender. But. Um, my face was all full of holes and the, the eyeball was, you know, bloody and my face was a mess and all that. And I, um, if you have distilled water, it will absorb one to three parts per thousand of essential oil. Like if you think about rose water, has a certain amount of rose oil in the water. Mm -hmm. And as soon as it's saturated, it floats to the top just like fat when you cook a chicken. Right. And that's the essential oil and then it's separated off. So uh, I thought, well, I, no, I think we're just going to stay here. And I, I had to, when chaos happens, you have to stay calm. And there's all sorts of triggers in life that, that throw you into the fight or flight response. And the only off button that you always have with you is a fully extended diaphragm. Hmm. So that old expression about, Maisel, Maisel, just take a deep breath, would you, honey? Like that is totally a valid thing to do. You take a deep breath and hold it for a while and let it out. And whether you're doing a photograph at a slow shutter speed or about to pull the trigger of a firearm, you don't hold your breath you pull that trigger as you're exhaling. Right. And that's when you're, you're most steady. And, and I, I always, when there's something, something's gone wrong, there's an accident or something, somehow my brain is wired to find something funny to focus on. Right. I, just, I just deal with shock and stress that way. Yeah. So as I went to pull this thing out of my, my eye, I actually thought, and I looked over at Dorothy and she said, what's wrong? And I said, I'm just worried that when I pull it out, I'm going to go shooting around the forest backwards. <laughs> <laughs> like, like out of a balloon, as if I was yeah. pulling out of a balloon. You know? And she, she laughed and, you know, that helped. But I, um, I just ever, and I can still remember the sound, that little <laughs> sound, Whoa. as I very slowly pulled that out because I didn't want it to splinter or anything. Yeah. You know, then I'd need surgery. Uh, and, I, and I just pulled it out. And I'd, I'd put just a few drops of lavender into this half-empty 
eight ounce or whatever, uh, 16 ounce, I don't know, half liter, whatever I had of distilled water and really shook it really well and just uh, filled my eye with it. Right. And then I got a, in my first aid kit, I actually had one of those eye patches. I just put a four inch gauze pad soaked with the lavender mix and um, felt it good. Wow. And um, by the time my wife got there later that afternoon and early evening, if you were really close, you would notice my eye was a bit bloodshot. But at this right. distance, you yeah. wouldn't have noticed anything wrong at all. Holy. With my eyes and, you know, most wow. of the stuff on my face. And cool. There was another time I was out with um, a student, and again, we were preparing for a party of some sort, and it was winter time, and uh, <clears throat> where we were going to have the site, there wasn't much for dead wood there, so I was going to drive a little further away with, with my truck and um, saw a couple of trees down and um, cut them up, put them in the truck, and then bring them back to camp. Yeah. And um, uh, I slipped once again on some snow, and there was one of the old branches was right in front of me, and I did a face plant right into this um, dead, excuse me, dead for a long time branch. Yeah. And I had all sorts of cuts and scrapes all over my face, and uh, a lot of blood was coming out, just as, uh, you might even know Kim Price. Do you know that? Does that ring a bell? That does ring a bell. He's, yeah. He would definitely be a client of yours. Okay. Uh, Kim was doing something over there, and and he, he just came around the corner with whatever he was carrying, and I watched his face turn chalk white. Right. And I said, is it bad? And he said, oh, buddy, what have you done? Right. And before I even moved, I looked at right underneath, you know how we get these, I think they're called wells, where you have, there might be four feet of snow, but then under a spruce, they, it could, yeah. there's bare ground on there. Right. There was a whole bunch of wintergreen. Right. And um, I just started chewing up all the wintergreen leaves uh, with some snow and, and holding my, patting my face and everything because we were, we were a ways from, the, the big first aid kit was back in camp. And he said, we gotta get, where's your first aid kit? And I said, back in camp. And he said, well, you know, and uh, there was a lot of blood coming out of my face. And I said, no, I think this is gonna be okay, Kim. I think, just give me a few minutes here. I just, I just let the wintergreen crushed up, chewed up, holding it in, in a handful, patting my face. And I said, no, I, I think I'm going to be okay. We'll, we'll just finish getting the truck loaded. Yeah. And he was astonished that I was that calm. Right. And not even going to go for the first aid kit. Yeah. You know, but because I had the wintergreen was, right. like I always say, when you really need something, it's usually within 10 feet. Yeah. And that was a day that, um, you know, by the time anybody came out, nobody would have even noticed anything unless they were really close to me. That, Amazing. You know, um, so... Yeah, it's it's quite astonishing how shit does come up or develop. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, one of the best advice items that I got when I before I did that trip when I was eighteen, I was interviewing wardens and trappers and elders, all sorts of people, and one of the best pieces of advice that I got from one old trapper was, take your time. You're gonna have lots, right? And the only time you're ever gonna slip with your axe and hurt yourself or anything like that is when you're rushing, right? Take your time. Yeah. And many years later, like the elderly gentleman next door, that was, he had a workshop in the basement of his house where you could, with the right stock around the right woods or metal, you could probably make. A handgun from scratch, or build build a kayak, yeah. Or in retirement, he was repairing very expensive violins, right. so he had every tool, Amazing. and taught me how to use them. Mm. And and that was that's what he said to no 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 yeah. no no. Let the tool do the work. Right. Never force a tool, mm. and that's why a lot of people have realized this that there's nothing more dangerous than a dull knife. Right. 
the sharper a knife is, the better it cuts. Yeah. And with no effort at all, you can slice things job, where yeah. you've got a dull knife and this, and you're doing this, yeah. and that's when you're going to yeah, slip and whatever. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Um, so there's first aid, and then there's second aid. Um, I'll mention this again, but there's a book that's, I think it's still in print, the cover changed, but it's called Medicine for Mountaineering. And it was, it was written by four, I think local boys actually, oh, okay. four doctors right. who climb mountains. Right. And they got together to write a book that was written by doctors for lay people right. about how to do some of these. And that's where I learned about the, uh, doing the tracheotomy. You know, uh, you can you just, and some people it's harder to find, but yeah. you tilt your head back and you can just find your voice boxes right there, right? Yeah. And it, it's, it's cartilage, that's, this, that's that little box. And you know, for, for men with big throats, and whatever, they have a low voice because they have a bass fiddle. And somebody with a really skinny little neck, and women in general, have a higher pitched voice, right? So, yeah, um, yeah it's, anyway. So there's, you find this little place where, the, where you find, there, there's the bump, and you can feel there's a V to it, sort of V shape. Right. And um, your, your whole airway has this cartilage. It's kind of like a vacuum cleaner, a hose. If it didn't have this stuff going on in the hose, it, you, it wouldn't work because when you turn the vacuum on, it would just suck the hose flat, right? Right. So that's how your, uh, your trachea works. And you find, you find that little V, and with just some pressure, you go down a little ways, and then there's a bit of space there. Mm -hmm. And then you can feel all the ribs, all those little coils that keep your trachea open. Yeah. They're not round, they're actually C-shaped because they're right next to your esophagus. Right. And so that if you're swallowing a big chunk of food, it, it, the, the airway kind of gives it room. <clears throat> and um, what you want to do, people have done this apparently, I haven't, with a big pen even. You take a big pen and break it in half and use it as a tube. And, uh, and then you need something. I would prefer to do it with scissors, and I've only done it, with one, done it once, um, is you, you pull the skin away, because your carotid arteries are here. You can't just take a knife and slash their neck open. Yeah. Right? So there's, and your thyroid, thyroid glands back there. So I would like, you can pull the skin away, and I'd, I'd rather have some good sharp scissors and snip a little bit of the skin, and then you can kind of see where you're going in there. And if you've got something, maybe if the scissors are pointed, even the scissors would work to go, it's called the cricothyroid cartilage. And, and you, find, you find that in the box, and you go to that magic spot yeah. before all of the coils start. And there's, there's just, it's right there, there's mine. Yeah. And uh, you make a little hole there and find something like a straw to keep the hole open with. Yeah. And um, huh. you can save a life if somebody's going into like, anaphylactic shock from a bee sting right. and there's no way there's nothing else to do yeah you know jeez so there's little things like that in that book cool well that's a good uh, good little preview for our next conversation tracheotomy at home no don't try that at home <laughs> well but it's incredible how information works sometimes you know you can yeah like that one i just had a sense might really come in handy right and there came a day when it was Sunday morning. We'd already been camping out for a day, and I, I went. The fire was already on, and um, we're getting some water coming to a boil for my coffee and her tea. And um, there was a bunch. There was a dead stand where a whole bunch of not too big uh, spruce trees had all gotten s snarled together by the wind. And I, I went over, and I was kind of wrestling these trees to get them apart so I could cut at them or pull some out. And I didn't really notice that in the same, that windstorm, there was one that was kind of folded this way and another one, like almost like a trap yeah. uh, going on, where when I was shaking one of them, this other one, this broke, and this other one flipped up, and it actually lifted me. It went right into my neck. Poof. And my feet were about four, four inches off the ground. And I just froze there for a minute, wow. suspended by my neck. And I thought, 
Okay, I don't want to wiggle this too much, but it would be better if I think my feet are just off the ground. Okay, now, the amazing part is from looking at that black and white line drawing in that book so many times over the years, Yeah, my real-time vision of me in the valley disappeared, and it went to a black, my, my, my vision was totally black with that diagram lit up in white. And then the carotid arteries lit up in red and a little red button showed up in the top right hand corner of the screen. Mm. And it was like, wah, 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 <laughs> carotids, you know, be careful. Yeah. And then um, a, a softer one in peach with the airways. But it was like something you'd see on a computer screen. Right. And uh, so I thought, Okay, well, we're going to get off of this now. I'm going to, so I, I was kind of pushing down on the, this, this is on the tree pushing away and getting my hand ready. And I thought, okay, if I, if I, if I pull away my hand slowly and I hear some slurping sounds, yeah, that'll be okay. But if, if I pull my hand away and I see a lot of blood, I'm going to be dead in under a minute. Yeah. And, and as I pushed down and kind of pulled myself away, there was only a couple little spots of blood, so I knew I wasn't going to die. Right. Wow. But the, it amazed me that that diagram, my real vision just went to a computer illustration wow. of the area, you know? And again, I could have just died that morning, hung on a tree, you Jeez. know? So I didn't have to do much at all. I just... Uh, yeah. Bandaged it, just got out some gauze and you know. Wow. Um, anyway. Yeah. So education can bounce back at the weirdest times years later. Right. Very cool. You know? Yeah. Things that you've learned and Yeah, totally. Yeah, we've been watching the show alone with uh, our daughter and uh, you know, a lot of these people they have experience, they've like they practice survival skills and but I get a sense a lot of them like I've never done this before right and it's it's only like oh you know I've heard or I've seen on a show or like you even hear people who survive you know some yep. crazy accident yep. and I remember one specifically this girl was like I survived because I used to watch a show with my dad and I remembered all the things like it just came to her and she just like tried them out and did them you know so yeah you don't know what uh, is going to come to your rescue right and, and in what shape, what form. But yeah, we better leave it there for today. I've been uh, looking at the mic here and uh, I see a flash for the uh, the battery. It's just about okay. dead, so. Maybe you can't hear me at all anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's still working, but it's on its last right. life there. Thanks so. for tuning in once again. Yeah, all right. We'll be back next week.